back to my channel. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So, whatever time you are watching this video, welcome back to my channel. So, this is Jomer Adams once again. And I just want to greet everyone. Hello, and I hope that everyone is really doing well today. So, I hope that um, you will be enjoying your time, your opportunity to learn something new today. And I will not be holding you too much long. And we will be going straight to our first discussion. So, it is all about your atomic absorption spectrophotometry. So, your atomic absorption spectrophotometry is a very important instrumentation in clinical chemistry. So, let's dig in. So, for this um, discussion, we will be talking about your atomic absorption spectrophotometry and the different components, the basic components with regards to your AAS. So, before we talk about your spectrophotometry, and if you haven't watched the video or the discussion regarding spectrophotometry, I will be giving you the link on the description box and also somewhere here in your screen it will just pop out so let's dig in so for first and foremost what is atomic absorption spectrophotometry so your aas is actually used to measure concentration by detecting the absorption of electromagnetic radiation by atoms rather than molecules yes what you heard was right what we are talking about now is no longer molecules. That is very much um, the respect in the job of your spectrophotometry. Now what we are uh, measuring is the absorption of your atoms. So we are talking about atoms. So now I just want you to differentiate those two because AAS and your spectrophotometry are two different instrumentation. So talking about your atoms, since we are talking about atoms, so, the usual things that we measure using your AAS are these elements. Usually, it's your aluminum, your calcium, your copper, your lead, your magnesium, your lithium, and your zinc. As you can see, most of these things are actually part of your electrolyte. Some are your trace elements um, and some are actually your, your, your heavy metals or your toxic elements that are usually seen in your patients. So, some you can see them normally in a patient and some you can see them if there is a lead poisoning or plumbism. Okay, so talking now about your atomic absorption spectrophotometry, your, your AES is actually 100 times more sensitive than your FES. And if you're asking what is FES, that is flame emission spectrometry. So, FES is somehow... um a very um, insensitive and non-specific method that's why we are actually using AAS more than your FES so AAS your atomic absorption spectrophotometry again is 100 times more sensitive than your FES so talking about the absorption of your atoms maybe you're asking how can we now determine the concentration of a particular atom, the concentration of a particular analyte or element using your AAS? So, the amount of light absorbed is actually proportional, directly proportional to the concentration of your analyte. Okay? So, it's very important for us to realize that very much similar to your spectrophotometry, it's also directly proportional to the concentration. Okay, so how does your atomic absorption spectrophotometry works? Okay, so here's the thing: what we have are actually moly what we have are actually atoms on their ground state. So usually, what we found, what we can actually collect from our patient are actually um, samples or analytes, and eventually those are only on its ground state. Okay, so they are on its ground state or in their neutral state. So what will happen is that they will now be excited. Okay, they will now be um, undergoing excitation whereby they will be go um, at their excited state. And then as you all know, as you all know, when you are in an, an, when you are on an excited state, you will be shifting back to your ground state. Okay, and that was the, and that what's happened to your atoms as well. They will be returning from excited state 
to their ground state and in that in that process they will now be emitting light okay they will now be emitting light so at the moment that your excited atom is returning back to its ground state the the process is actually through emitting a particular light okay through emitting a particular light so again your excited atoms when they return to their ground state they will start emitting light of the same energy as it absorbed so the amount of energy the type of energy the wavelength of energy that your atom absorb will be the same amount of light when it comes to wavelength and energy that it will be emitting so i hope that's clear so i just want to go back again and explain that when we are doing atomic absorption spectrophotometry, what we have are atoms on its ground state. So for us to be able to measure them, we will be under we will be exposing them to a particular energy for them to be excited. And from excited, they will actually be returning to their ground state. Okay, they will be returning to their ground state, and in that process, they will now be emitting light from that atom okay so i hope that is clear so this is actually the normal um the simplest um format or representation of the atomic absorption spectrophotometry instrumentation what we have here are actually your light source we also have your chopper you also have your nebulizer your atomizer all on the same all all on the same side and then you have your monochromator you have your photo detector and then you also have your readout device so let's go on one by one the first one is of course your light source so what does your light source do so your light source first and foremost is of course the source of your incident light so in aas we actually have two types of light source the first one is actually your electrodeless discharge lamp and your halo cathode lamp okay so let me first explain what is your hal your electrodeless discharge lamp and your halo cathode lamp so your electrodeless discharge lamp is consists of a bulb containing or filled with your argon and the element to be tested so it actually uses radio frequency generator to excite to excite the element on the other hand we also have your halo cathode lamp what does your halo cathode lamp do so it actually is consists of an evacuated gas type chamber containing an anode a cylindrical cathode and an inert gas usually argon as well and your helium so it actually is separated it's it actually requires a separate lamp for each metal okay so if you're measuring a particular element take for example it's your your al aluminum a different lump it's required for aluminum a different lump is required for your copper zinc so on and so forth and maybe you're asking how does your halo cathode lump produces light how does your electrode less discharge lamp produces la produces light i hope you're actually um have do you actually have your bishop with you on your side so your halo cathode lamp let me go first to your halo cathode lamp so your halo cathode lamp produces light this way so remember that within the chamber you have your helium and your argon okay now we also have your cathode and your anode so what will happen inside the gas type chamber is that this helium and argon will now be attracted the ions will be attracted to the cathode so the moment that they are being attracted to the cathode, they will now be bumping into metals within the gas type chamber. And if that happens, the bumping of those ions into those metal will cause its excitation. Okay? And again, when an uh, when an ion is excited, as it returns back to its ground state, it will now be releasing your light. And that is how your cathode Halo cathode lump produces light. It actually attracts first the ion to it to the cathode, bumping into the chain, bumping into the metals, and then eventually those ions are excited, and eventually they will be returning to its ground state, producing the light. Okay. On the other hand, we also have your electrode less discharge lamp. 
the manner is actually very much similar to your hollow cathode lamp the only difference that the only difference between the two is that it doesn't have your cathode or your anode in your electrode discharge lamp what we have are actually your radio frequency generator so very much similar to your hollow cathode lamp you also have your ions in the form of your argon so your argon are being excited how through your radio frequency generator so the moment that again your argon is excited it will return back to its ground state now emitting your light so that is how your aas light source produces your light again we all we have two types your electrodeless discharge lamp and your hollow cathode lamp i hope the exp my explanation was clear so let's move on to the next part which is your beam chopper as you can see your beam chopper is one unique feature of your atomic absorption spectrophotometry and i want you to take note of this one very much um uh, i want you to take note of this because this is very much important okay so your beam chopper what does it do it actually modulates the ca the hollow cathode light beam so isn't it that a light actually when when a light is being when your light source is producing light it's actually producing a light that is consistent when it comes to its intensity so what does your beam chopper does it actually produces pulses of light like what you are seeing in the gif that i provided below so in this case the beam the beam chopper now will cause uh, will cause the system to have pulses of light okay pulses of light and um i just want you to hold on when it comes to the beam chopper because as we go along i will be explaining to you what is the importance of your beam chopper so that is what your beam chopper does again it modulates the hollow cathode light beam and it actually produces pulses of light so like a christmas light like this one and also this one so later on i'll be explaining why is it very much important so after your your beam chopper we go now to your nebulizer okay we go now to your nebulizer and this is again very important because again going back to the definition of aas we are no longer measuring molecules but atoms so how do we do that that is through the help of your nebulizer and later on by your flame or your atomizer so let's move on to your nebulizer your nebulizer its main goal is actually to deliver a fine spray of the sample containing met your metallic ion into your flame or your cylinder or in a nutshell we can call it your atomizer okay we can simply call this one your we can simply we can simply call that your atomizer so when it comes to your 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 nebulizer it actually delivers your sample into your into your flame or your cylinder so maybe you're asking what why, why do we have a flame and why do we have a cylinder okay why do you have a flame and why do you have a cylinder so here's here comes now your atomizer so as you can see you cannot see a cuvette or a sample cell here why simply because your flame or your burner or your gra your your graphite furnace is the sample cell of the instrument itself okay so we deliver from the nebulizer we deliver the sample going to your flame or going to your cylinder which is in turn your atomizer and at the very same time it is also the sample cell when i say sample cell it's the one that holds the sample while it is being measured so what does your atomizer does by the way so your atomizer dissociates the solution into its neutral and individual atoms so take for example you have your your sodium your your we have you have your we have your elements that is bound to different molecules at the same time we have your atoms that are bound either to a protein to to whatever molecule biomolecule on your solution your atomizer's job is actually to to produce an individual and a neutral atom out of that and how do you do that that is through your atomizer and we actually have two types of atomizer we have your flame atomizer and we have your electrothermal atomizer which is your graphite furnace in your electrothermal atomizer you can actually hear it as well as the flameless 
Atomic Absorption Spectrophotometry because it doesn't use your flame anymore but it uses your graphite furnace. So let me explain to you what happened first. So as I was mentioning a while back, your atomizer is also your sample cell. This is where your sample is being held while it is being measured in the system. So your atomizer, let's go first to your flame atomizer, can actually be of propane in nature. Okay, your your flame atomizer can actually be a fuel gas. It can actually be of propane in nature or acetylene with an oxidizing agent or a compressed gas, which is burned to produce a flame. So that is how your flame atomizer is. Okay, so again, coming from your nebulizer, you spray your sample into your flame atomi your flame atomizer for it to be atomized and at the same time for it to be held while it is being measured. We also have your electrothermal atomizer and this is again in your flame less atomic absorption. So we are using your graphite furnace. So what we have here are, are actually graphite cylinder. So from your nebulizer it your your sample will be held in your graphite cylinder in your graphite cylinder and eventually that graphite cylinder will be um will be subjected to increasing temperature whereby your sample now will start to evaporize and at as your sample start to evaporize it will now start to be um liberated from whatever molecule it is bound now forming an atomized sample okay an atomized sample so that's what happened between your flame atomizer and your electrothermal atomizer. So the only difference that in your flame atomizer, there is flame. In your electrothermal atomizer, there is no flame because you are using your graphite furnace. Again, your graphite, your graphite cylinder holds your sample and then your, your temperature will be increased, thereby evaporating the sample, forming now your atoms. Okay? So I hope... We are clear so that is for your atomizer so again going back we did discuss your light source we did discuss your beam chopper your nebulizer your flame or your atomizer in general now we go to your monochromator and your photo detector we're actually nearing the end so your monochromator similarly to our spectrophotometer is the actually controls the light absorbed by the um, by the sample so the light absorbed by the sample is in pulses thus the light it emits is also in pulses so it is the monochromator isolate the desired emission line from the other lamp emission lines so it also has your entrance and exit slit so your monochromator in a nutshell um isolate a particular light coming from your sample that it will now be delivering to your photo detector again the photo detector we are using is your photo multiplier tube the most sensitive why here now here comes now the explanation we are using your photo multiplier tube because what we are measuring here in your aas are actually bursts or pulses of light i want us to return to bullet number one of your monochromator again the light absorbed by the the sample are in pulses how does it happen okay how does it happen the light coming from your your light source again is being chopped by your beam chopper producing now only pulses of light okay pulses of light and though dot pulses of light are being absorbed by the sample in that very same manner okay so that your atoms are actually absorbing light by pulses and will also be emitting light by pulses so imagine that it is actually blinking or twinkling similar to your christmas light so the energy the light that it receives are in pulses so the light that will it will also be emitting is also in the form of pulses okay sir maybe you are sir madam maybe you are wondering why is the pulses so important i want you to remember this in your atomic absorption spectrophotometry there are two types of light and that is the light coming from your light source whether it is an electrode less or a halo cathode lamp and of course when you are using your flame atomizer there is also light coming from your flame 
Correct? So those are two types of light. So the question now is that how can we discriminate the light coming from your light source and the one that is just coming from my flame? Okay? And what you want to measure is actually the light that is coming from your atoms that came from your light source. So how do you do that? What they did is actually to incorporate now your beam chopper. So that is what the beam chopper does. The beam chopper... Um, the beam chopper produces pulses of light, therefore, your atoms also absorb pulses of light. Ergo, thus, it also be emitting pulses of light. And those pulses of light will be the, will be the only light to be detected by your monochromator and your photo detector. And then, the light coming from your flame will be electronically eliminated from the system. So imagine that, okay? Imagine that. I want you to imagine that as we are actually going through, okay? So take for example this one. Your your samples are in this are in this part. As you can see from the light source, it's a continuous light, but after passing through the the chopper, it will now be in pulses represented by the broken light i hope you are following my 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 laser so my laser pointer so it will now be in pulses so the atoms your analyte within that will also be absorbing the light by pulses okay it will now be absorbing the light by pulses so what we want is to this again what do we what do we want is to discriminate the light coming from the sample and the light coming from your flame so how do we do that okay the monochromator and your photo detector your photomultiplier tube are programmed only to detect and only to measure the pulsating light or the pulses coming from your atoms so in that case the light coming from your your flame or your burner will be electronically eliminated from the system so in that case you only will be able to measure the pulses of light therefore you will now be correctly measuring the concentration of your molecule okay so that's what your monochromator does there so in your photo detector again it's your photomultiplier tube okay one very good reason why the photomultiplier tube is that when you go back to the definition of photomultiplier tube it is actually very much sensitive because it can detect quick bursts of light and short or li low intensity light and it is very important in the case of your atomic absorption spectrophotometry because again you are measuring pulses of light so in a nutshell in 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 simpler terms your photomultiplier can detect quick bursts of light or quick pulses of light now coming from your sample or coming from your atoms that's why when it comes to photo detector in your aas we only talk about one and that is your photo multiplier tube okay so in a nutshell now that is your atomic absorption spectrophotometry you have your your atomic absorption spectrophotometry already you have your basic components and of course that is all about your atomic uh, atomic absorption spectrophotometry we discussed the atomic absorption the components and of course the different um, function of those um, components within your atomic absorption spectrophotometry so i hope you did learn something new today and i hope um, i made myself clear so one thing that you i really need you to understand here are the pulses of light okay the pulses of light because that's very important so your, again your atomic absorption spectrophotometry measures the light absorbed by your atoms okay the light absorbed by your atoms so so to end this discussion let me leave you this quote from martin luther king jr saying intelligence plus character that is the true goal of education so i hope you had a great time with me tonight so if you have questions so please do leave a comment in the comment section and if you have further questions just email me to my in my email so i i am leaving it here so i am actually encouraging you to to leave comments down below so we will be discussing your questions 
on the comment in the discussion box in the comment section and aside from that if you want me to do um make a video on uh, uh, make to make a video a study video on how i will be studying your atomic absorption spectrophotometry please leave a comment down below and i will be doing a study guide a, a video while i am studying your aas and i will be sharing to you my techniques so without further ado thank you so much this has been jomar adams and i hope you did learn something new today so i would want to request everyone to please like this video share this video and please do subscribe to my channel again thank you so much and have a great day ahead of you.